scripture reading today is on page 811, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Thanks, Sam. Really good to see you all here this uh, morning. My name is Mikey, if we've not met. Well, we all care about the opinions and the approval of others, don't we? We want people to like us. We want our friends to like us. We want our, our colleagues, our boss to uh, notice all the hard work that we put in in the office. We want our family to be proud of our achievements. Uh, we care whether people um, like our posts on social media or not. We're secretly gutted if no one shows their approval we are used to living for the approval of others. But Jesus warns us here that um, that is actually a very dangerous habit to bring into the Christian life. Um, verse 1 is our headline, really, for our passage today. Uh, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. By practicing your righteousness, Jesus is talking about the Christian life, uh, the various things, deeds, actions that a Christian does. He gives examples of giving money and of praying, uh, but it would also include other things, uh, Christian service, hospitality, um, evangelism even, I think. But the main point, um, I've tried to sort of summarize it on your sheets on the back of the handout there from verse 1, is to, to watch our motivations when we are doing public Christian living. Not that it is wrong to do any of those things in public. Some areas of the Christian life have to be public. Uh, we are encouraged to pray with other people together. Um, and of course, most areas of service in church, for instance, are public. But the question is, whose approval are we seeking as we go about doing those things? Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. We could say it comes down to who do we want to be seen by? Do we care about uh, God watching or who else other people are watching? So first, Jesus outlines the wrong motivation for us, which is doing it for the approval of others. The first example he gives is in verse 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, uh, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. So maybe we can picture it, Phil the Pharisee, um, he saved up his money for a special sort of festival day, um, and he's hired a trumpeter um, to, to come along with him as he processes very solemnly through the, the streets to draw a crowd. And as he arrives at the synagogue entrance, he nudges this trumpet guy to give a special loud, da, 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 make way for Phil the Generous. Um, and then he comes right into the middle where everyone can see him, and he gets out this big bag of coins, and he pours it from a great height so that everyone can see and hear his coins clinking into the pot. Uh, then he's arranged for the, the local press to be there, um, and so um, he gets out one of those supersized cardboard checks, um, and he's sort of parading around with it, um, posing for photographs, and soaking up all the applause. Well, unsurprisingly, Jesus says, when you give... Don't do it like that. People like Phil have got it all wrong because, end of verse 2, they are doing it for the wrong reasons, that they may be praised by others. 
They're hypocrites, Jesus says. The motivation is self-serving. It's not about serving God. It can be true with prayer as well. Verse 5. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Well, again, we can picture Phil after he's finished his sort of um, uh, his laps around the, the, the synagogue. He goes up on a stage and then very sort of ceremoniously bows down and starts praying in front of everyone. And maybe on his way home, he stops to pray on a street corner where he's worked out that people can see him from multiple directions. He's got maximum sight lines so that people can think and see how holy he is. Down in verse um, 16, um, uh, beyond our passage, Jesus actually gives a third example of this kind of wrong motivation. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. So people were encouraged to fast, to not eat for a period, um, at certain festivals and so on, as a way of focusing on God. But the hypocrites, well, I guess they kind of steal their wives' makeup bag, and they uh, make themselves look all sort of pale and sick, uh, as though they've been fasting for far longer than they actually have uh, maybe they, they put bags around their eyes so that people think, oh gosh, has that guy been up praying all night? Um, that kind of thing. And if we think about um, translating it to today, well, I guess uh, we might find or come across occasionally uh, some people uh, doing it um, just as shamelessly for earthly approval. Um, we might think of the prosperity gospel pastor who's really in it all for the celebrity status and the, the massive paycheck that he gets to take home. But slightly more subtly, it could be the sort of traditional churchgoer, I guess, whose um, 30 years of attendance, maybe being a sidesman at their church, is a much quoted reason um, for them being a well-respected member of their community. Um, or even close to home, even in good, good churches like our own, um, hopefully, uh, that there can um, be people um, who are involved who are known as Christians, and yet they are doing it primarily um, for the approval of others. Um, whether that is um, just primarily they want to fit in, uh, maybe it's uh, primarily they want to make friends, uh, maybe it's they, they just don't want to disappoint their family, um, but it is not flowing from genuine faith. And Jesus says, beware of that. Uh, it is serious, because it means that there is no further reward from God. Back to our summary in verse 1. Uh, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. The point is repeated in the examples as well. End of verse 2, um, for the trumpet blaring donors, uh, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. And it's the same for the street corner prayers and the makeup wearing fasters. Um, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Their actions may have impressed a few people in the moment, but that is the only reward that they're going to get. Their reward is in the past, received. They'll have no further reward from God. They will miss out on the ultimate reward, which is heaven itself. Because although they claim to live for God, well, really they're doing it for their own benefit. They're fakes. Hypocrites, Jesus says. They're not true Christians. But how tragic it is um, that churchgoers um, could uh, choose the fleeting reward of earthly praise um, at the expense of the ultimate reward of heaven. It's like one of those um, raffles where there's a whole range of prizes, mostly a sort of a few little token things, but there's one big main prize, uh, a luxury holiday home. And a little boy is announced as the first winner. He's invited up to the table to come and pick his prize. And he's, he's perusing all the, the options. His family are obviously yelling for him to, to take the keys to the luxury holiday home. But then his eyes settle on a, a toffee apple. And in the moment, uh, well, he just thinks, well, wow, that that's a reward I can enjoy right now. And so, to the dismay of his family looking on, he forfeits that main prize for the sake of a toffee apple now. Well, that is how short-sighted it is to live for earthly approval now um, because we are at risk of forfeiting the biggest prize of all, God's approval in heaven. And that brings us to the flip side and our next point, the true way for the Christian, doing it only for our Father. 
This is particularly explicit with Jesus teaching on prayer. Um, If you have a look down to verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. Jesus repeatedly uses this language of Father um, in the Sermon on the Mount because it is that relationship that a Christian has with God that should drive all of our Christian behavior. It's easy to think of uh, prayer and giving and uh, service as kind of like chores and just a list of rules that Christians should do. But Christianity isn't about rules. Christianity is about a relationship with God as our Father. And all these things, prayer, giving, service, they're all just expressions of that. And this prayer certainly a fundamental expression of God being our Father, our ability to come to Him as our dad and speak to him about anything. It's a privilege, a privilege to make the most of, a chance to deepen our relationship with our Father. And how sad, how kind of twisted, if if we were to sort of take um, speaking to our Father and and change that to to be something that we just kind of use to impress other people. Um, Or what a waste if if we only talk to our Father on a Sunday when we say amen to prayers at church. But Jesus says, uh, set aside a bit of one-on-one time. You see, he says, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father. I think that's a bit of a helpful test. I mean, do we ever pray on our own uh, when it's just us and God and no one else watching? Because those are the moments when we realize that there's no point doing it for anyone else. (laughs) We're only there praying for the sake of having a real conversation with our Father. And even when we are praying around other people, uh, maybe joining in with the the confession and so on here at church, well, well, the point is to make sure that we are still praying genuinely as we do those things to our Father, not just going through the rituals. Or maybe if we're praying at the end of a a summer small groups evening with a few others around a table, uh, well, let's not worry about um, whether others will think that our prayer is sort of theologically impressive, uh, whether we're using the right buzzwords and all that kind of stuff. Um, Just speak to your father who loves you. There's a story of a man whose uh, father always took him running. And even though he wasn't very good, uh, they enjoyed doing it together. But eventually his father got a bit too old and and gave it up. Uh, But his his son decided to enter a marathon. Uh, Quite a challenge for him, but he was doing it in his dad's honor. And that was really the only thing that kept him going through the long hours of training. And then when the day arrived itself, Um, Although he was being cheered on by all sorts of people, the crowds around him, uh, he wasn't doing it for them. He was doing it only for his father. And it should be the same for us. Do it for our father in all areas of the Christian life. Um, Think of the opportunities that we may have to serve at church or for some of us on camp um, over the coming weeks. Others probably will be watching as we help out with various things. But don't do it for their approval. Don't do it just because someone has asked us to. Jesus would say, do it for your father out of love for him. Or say we need to prepare for a Sunday school lesson or for a talk at summer small groups or for a study on camp. Uh, Well, let's try and do it well, um, but watch our motivations. Let's not just be doing it just to avoid um, stuffing it up and being embarrassed. Let's not do it Um, so that people think that we're a a sort of solid, impressive Christian. Let's do it for our Father. And the same goes with our giving. If you glance to verse 3, Jesus uses an interesting phrase. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. I guess we could picture um, a collection, financial collection going around at church, that sort of thing, and uh, say I've got a tenner in my right pocket, And Jesus says, well, okay, Mr. Right Hand, um, here's a secret mission for you. Uh, I want you to get into that pocket uh, and drop that tenor into that bag so subtly, so discreetly, that not even your left hand sees, uh, let alone anyone else. The gist is to keep it as secret as possible. I guess so that we're not tempted to do it for the approval of others. By the way, that's one reason why we actually don't pass around a collection here at St. Nick's with everyone watching. Uh, Jesus wants us to give um, out of a a relationship with our Father, not for earthly pressure, in light of how uh, incredibly generous God has been to us, giving us everything we have. I mean, all our money, (laughs) that is all from Him, isn't it? 
and giving is only giving back what is already his. But of course, he's given us so much. He's given us his son to rescue us, to adopt us into his family. And when we think of those things, when we consider our relationship with our father, uh, well, we'll be rightly motivated to give. We'll want to use our finances for the things that our father cares about, for those in his family in need around the world, and of course, for uh, gospel advance, for churches, for ministries uh, seeking to make and grow disciples of Jesus. And we're so thankful for um, uh, the support of many of uh, you here at St. Nick's. You really make it possible for the extent of the ministry that goes on here to happen. Um, Perhaps if if we're not yet giving to gospel work, well, please do consider starting within your means. Um, Jesus does, I think, assume here that Christians will give. That is a normal sort of healthy thing to do. Uh, There's information on our website if you'd like to find out more. But the big point that Jesus is making is that when we give, do it for the right reasons. Do it out of love for our Father and all he's done for us. Do it for the gospel. And if we can hang on to this kind of motivation, well, there is a repeated encouragement for us. Uh, End of verse 4, as well as verse 6 and 18, and get this, uh, this another refrain. Your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. So let's just dwell on the two sides of that encouragement briefly. Firstly, uh, doing it for our Father will be seen, even in secret. The great thing about um, giving or or praying or or serving um, when it's just us in secret is that it genuinely becomes an audience of one. Uh, No one else sees, but your Father in heaven sees. It's worth saying that apart from the person who deals with the gift aid uh, forms, uh, none of the staff Uh, knows who is giving financially to St. Nick's. We don't know how much people are giving. Um, And so if we were to start giving, um, or say we're in a position to sort of uh, increase our standing order perhaps, well, we won't get lots of kind of thank yous, lots of slaps on the back, sort of winks and nudges the next Sunday as we come in. Uh, No one will know, but our Father will know. No one will know. That is as long as we resist the temptation to sort of mention it to our small group and sort of CC in some of the staff team as we sort of email the finance uh, email and that kind of thing. Uh, That would be like uh, sort of going for the main prize but then also trying to grab a toffee apple sort of on the way home, wouldn't it? To use, go back to that raffle illustration. Uh, No, we won't do that. And um, so no one will know, but our father will know. And he'll love it. He loves it when we're generous. He loves it when we reflect what he is like, his generosity. Or say we're coming in early on a Sunday or or staying back to serve in some way. And and most people don't see the time and the effort that we're putting in. Um, Or we're doing the kids washing at home. Or or we're on camp and we're up late uh, preparing something for the kids for the next day. And we don't get any appreciation from them uh, the next day. Uh, The kids are completely oblivious to it all. But our father, he sees it. He appreciates it. When I'm coming down um, the few little steps um, before you come into our living room in our flat, I often catch a glimpse of what Finn, our sort of one and a half year old, is up to. And sometimes I just sort of pause and just have a have a little peek before um, I come into the room and before he realizes I'm there. And sometimes he's obviously kind of going a bit mental, throwing his toys and books all over the place, that sort of thing. But occasionally I catch him doing something uh, that's really quite sweet, maybe sort of giving his his baby brother Zach a little cuddle, that kind of thing although it often looks a bit more like a body slam. Um, But it really is kind of lovely to know that sometimes he he genuinely wants to do something kind of kind or or nice, not just when uh, we tell him to or because he thinks we're watching. Um, And it means a lot more to me, that actually, uh, because he wasn't doing it to be seen. He was doing it in secret, he could say. And yet I did see it, and it brought a smile to my face. Well, it's similar with our Christian labors. Maybe we've taken up Jesus' challenge and, and we're in our room alone and we've carved out a few minutes to, uh, to, to do a bit of praying, to work through a prayer list, say, on prayer mate, something like that. Um, we may be tempted to think, oh, is this a bit pointless? Here I am alone. But our Father sees. He listens. See, not one thing that we do for him goes unnoticed. And I take it that each one brings a smile to his face. And that brings us to the reward. See, deeds done for our Father will be rewarded. 
Now, primarily, the Christian's reward is in heaven, isn't it? In verse 1, Jesus reminds us that that's where our Father is, in heaven. Um, And that future is always the main place that we are encouraged to look to for blessing, a home of perfect bliss, uh, where every Christian will experience the joy of salvation in all its fullness. But the Bible does actually hint at reward in heaven being linked to the way that we live the Christian life now. Later in Matthew uh, chapter 25, we get the parable of the tenants, and and Jesus encourages Christians there to to use what they have to serve wholeheartedly, uh, that we might hear God say to us as we enter heaven, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. It's interesting that Jesus singles out faithfulness in serving as grounds for our joy as we enter heaven. Isn't that a good motivation for us? That every act of faithful service will somehow be in view as we're welcomed into heaven. Uh, Not that we earn our place there, but we'll sort of be aware of how everything that we've done for for God, for Jesus, was all worth it. So we have this incomparable future reward. But there are also rewards in the present for Christians as well. I mean, we have the joy of, I guess, seeing how the things that we do, our our Christian deeds, can benefit others sometimes, whether through meeting some financial need or or serving in some way that maybe helps the the Sunday service to run smoothly. Um, Maybe we get the encouragement of seeing our prayers answered, uh, which our Father loves to do. But more generally, I guess, there's just the present satisfaction of of knowing that the way that we can live now uh, genuinely can please our Father. Isn't that an amazing thought, that our day-to-day actions might bring a smile to the face of our Father in heaven? And that alone should really be enough of a reward for us. But combine that with the the certainty of um, the full experience of God's approval that we'll, we'll find in the future in heaven. Well, how much better is our Father's reward than the fickle and kind of momentary approval that we might get? from uh, mere mortal man. Why would we go after that silly toffee apple when it might actually tarnish the reward that we get from our Father? Not that we should ever worry about um, forfeiting our our place in heaven. Of course, all Christians slip up, and um, as long as we keep coming back to Jesus and uh, turning uh, to Him in trust and turning, uh, acknowledging our need for His death for our sins, well, there is always forgiveness but I guess in, in a sort of small way, we're slipping into that, uh, that wrong motivation of, of seeking others' approval as we do certain things. Well, it may forfeit our Father's approval in the moment for that deed. I mean, uh, to take an example, if we were to maybe um, uh, see a, a Christian quote or a Christian prayer, something like that, on, on social media, um, uh, we, we, we might want to sort of repost that or, or find something else to, to post similarly. Um, but if we're doing it, it mainly because... Um, we kind of want to, to be in with people who do that. That's the kind of thing, uh, mainly just to impress others rather than because we've actually uh, prayed it in much ourselves. Well, I take it God isn't really impressed by that very much. I take it that's not the kind of thing that will bring a smile to his face. So why would we um, forfeit our heavenly Father's approval in the present to go after a bit of earthly approval? See, the reward from our Father is so much better, isn't it? And so let's try and do it all for Him. Well, we'll finish there. Um, Why don't we just take a moment to consider uh, what we might want to take away from this passage ourselves over the coming weeks, and then I'll pray. But just a moment now. Father God, thank you so much that you love us dearly as your children. Um, Thank you so much that you notice every single thing that we do for you, even when no one else sees. Please help us not to be swayed by earthly approval, um, but to live um, wholeheartedly for for your approval alone. Uh, 
please keep us looking forward to that day when, when you will say, well done, good and faithful servant, as we enter into your joy in heaven. Please keep our eyes fixed on that reward. In Jesus' name, amen.